Hello and welcome to Bridlington Christian Fellowship Online. We're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 3, so let me read that for us now. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carried the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is in flood all during harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, while the water flowing down to the sea of the Araba, the, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by, until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Well, we're looking at the first six chapters of Joshua, uh, and they are a great uh, source of God's encouragement, strength and help for us, both in the difficult circumstances we're currently living through, and also as we look to the future. The challenge for us is to prepare now for what God may send tomorrow as we look to his leading and guidance for life beyond lockdown. In chapter 1, God called us to be strong and courageous and trust solely in him. Last week, the story of Rahab and the spies in chapter 2 encouraged us to be alert to how God is at work in the present so that we can respond to this as he leads us into the future he has prepared for us. Now our focus is on something that we all need in these challenging times and that is to be encouraged. It's always great when we get an encouragement isn't it? Over the past few weeks I've been encouraged by receiving the unexpected gift of a book token listening to Skylarks when out walking the dog and talking to my four-year-old niece via a video link. Things like this encourage us, but often their effects only last for a short time. When God wants us to be encouraged, he does not want this encouragement to be over quickly. He wants us to know constant encouragement in the work he calls us to do. The best way for us to be encouraged constantly is for an encourager to be present with us. Elin and I have been rereading J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. 
and so often in his battle scenes Tolkien shows that encouragement is to be found in leaders, kings like Theoden or Aragorn as they take the lead against the evil of the opposing forces. Their presence and their actions encourage all around them to take the fight to the enemy and so win the day. That's what we're going to see in chapter 3. But the big difference here is that Israel is to be encouraged not by the presence of any human leader, not even Joshua, but by the presence and action of God himself. And as we learn from the past in Joshua, we can be encouraged to live in the present and look to the future because, as we will see, God is with his people. Now Israel needs to be encouraged because things are about to get real as they cross the river Jordan to take possession of the land that God had promised them. Chapter 3 begins as they move their camp from where they'd been based at Shittim to the banks of the river. At this stage they must have been thinking about the obstacles ahead of them. The greatest cha challenge to possessing the land was of course its inhabitants, the people who lived there. The Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites and Jebusites. To conquer these peoples was going to be a daunting task and not for the faint-hearted. Then there was the most immediate obstacle of the river Jordan itself. And we see in verse 15 that the Jordan is in flood all during harvest, which is when Israel were preparing to cross over. One writer explains what this situation actually meant. The river Israel faced that spring that springtime was no placid stream, but a raging torrent, probably a mile wide and covering a mass of tangled brush and jungle growth. It looked impossible to cross, a formidable barrier for Israel. It was right at this point that God's people needed to be encouraged. They needed an encouragement for the present moment that was built on the past and would also encourage them to follow God's leading into the future. God knew this and that was precisely what he was going to do. God's encouragement begins with personal promises. Promises to his people and promises to his servant Joshua. God's promise to the people of Israel is told to them by Joshua in verse 5. Joshua tells them, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now this is a vitally important statement. To prepare to cross the river Jordan did not simply mean that you took care to pack up all your worldly goods, took your tent down and stowed it away ready for travel. The most important part of the preparation was consecration. Now consecration is a spiritual act and simply means preparing our hearts, our minds and our lives to wholeheartedly serve God. It's when these things are put right that we willingly trust obey and follow God's leading and our spiritual eyes are opened to see him at work. This God consecration gets God's people ready to see God act. But this isn't God acting in the distance. It's God being personally with his people and acting in the midst of them. God's promise is that as they prepare themselves to trust and follow him, he will act at the heart of his people in amazing ways so that they are strengthened and encouraged. Joshua also needs God's personal encouragement because he is the one God has chosen to lead his people into the promised land. Joshua's witnessed everything that's happened when Moses was Israel's leader and he knows full well just how challenging 
God's call on his life is. But he also knows that Moses' help and strength in all the challenges and struggles of leadership came from God. That's why the personal promise of God to Joshua in verse 7 would be so precious. God says, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you, as I was with Moses. In saying this, God is reminding Joshua of his promise in chapter 1. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Joshua's encouragement now was that he was going to see something of those promises fulfilled immediately, so that he had the confidence in God to lead God's people into the future. This is a very exciting moment for God's people. They're going to see God's words of promise being matched by his actions in a very short space of time. Israel are going to be powerfully reminded by what's about to happen that the living God is among you and that God is true and faithful to those promises he has made. They can also be encouraged that as God keeps the promises he is making to them, at this point he will certainly also keep his promises to drive out the nations from the promised land. In verses 9 to 13 of God's instructions to Israel, Joshua tells them, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. These are instructions that are to be listened to carefully and obeyed. God gives his people the detail of what he wants them to do in verses 11 to 13. They're to follow the Ark of the Covenant to the river. And as soon as the priest carrying the Ark of the Lord of all the earth began to set foot in the river, God would cut off all the waters flowing downstream and stand them up in a heap together. The people would then be able to cross over on the dry ground that was there. And those 12 men that are to be selected, one from each tribe, we're going to find are going to be significant when we come to look at chapter 4. Now the Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box plated with gold and made to contain the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai in two tablets. It's also seen as God's footstool, the place where he met with those who served him. The ark was carried in front of the people when they were on the move together as a sign that he was personally present with them. The people need to take care of them. God is a holy and perfect God. And so we see that they follow the ark and also pass by it. They are, they're, they're told to keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Now this is a distance of well over half a mile or 900 metres. And the reason for this is that God must be honoured and his will followed so that his people may live and enjoy the benefits that he wants to give them. Even God's people are far from his perfect standards and those who come too close to him will die. Turning to verses 14 to 17, we now witness something that gives God's people tremendous cause to be encouraged. God powerfully keeps his promises. What God has said will happen, happens in exactly the way God has promised it will. As the priests led the people forward, once their feet touched the edge of the flooded river Jordan, the river waters piled up at a town called Adam, some distance upstream. Then as the priests stood with the ark on the river bed, the whole of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Just as God 
had led Israel out of slavery in Egypt under Moses' leadership by parting the waters of the Red Sea. So now he led them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua by parting the waters of the River Jordan. God's promises to his people and to Joshua were clearly fulfilled. They could be encouraged that God was in the midst of them and was certainly leading them forward to possess the land he had prepared for them. As we think about the events of Joshua 3, seeking to learn from the past so that we can live in the present and look to the future with God, then we can also be encouraged. In particular, we can be encouraged that knowing God is with us is not limited to a particular time or place. We don't have to be an Israelite crossing the River Jordan to know that God is with us. The radical and remarkable desire of, that God has for men and women is that he wants us to be encouraged by his presence day by day. It doesn't matter who we are, where we come from or what our background is. God wants us to have a real relationship with him. However, as we saw earlier, God is a holy God. He is perfect and pure. Even Israel, his own people, had to keep a distance of over half a mile from him because none of them could meet his perfect standard. None of them could live with his perfection. The discouraging thing is that we are all in this situation. We are all far away from God and meeting the perfect standards that he wants us to keep. This problem is what the Bible calls sin. And sin is those things we want, think, say or do, which reveal that we've turned away from God to follow the paths which we think are best for our own lives. We live to our own standards and not his, and that's true of everyone. The Bible shows us the reality that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. God has a great and unfathomable love for you and for me. That love is so great that he chose to deal with our sin himself because he knew it was impossible for us to change ourselves. God did this as he sent his only son Jesus into the world and Jesus obeyed God perfectly even to allowing himself to be taken and put to death on a cross. There he did what you and I could never do. He paid the penalty in full to God that we deserve to pay for our sin against him. He took God's just punishment for that sin on his own shoulders and accepted and God accepted his payments in full. It means that if we trust in Jesus for our sin to be forgiven and commit our lives to no longer living to please ourselves but to live for him alone then he will heal our hearts from the damage that sin has caused. If we put our trust in Jesus, we can now be encouraged that in him we can be called righteous before God. In Jesus, we now have a right standing before God and we have a new relationship with him. As we trust in Jesus, we are given God's gift of his Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in the new life that he has given to us. If you've not yet put your trust in Jesus to make you right with God if you don't yet know the forgiveness and healing that Jesus brings if you don't yet know God's new life in Jesus then I would urge you to trust in him while you still have the opportunity to do so to know Jesus is to be encouraged by his daily presence leading and guiding you through life to a wonderful future with him forever. May you trust in him and come to find the reality of these things.
for yourself. Just as Joshua and the people of Israel were encouraged that God was personally with them, so we as Christians can be encouraged that God is personally with us through Jesus. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, all those who trust in him can know his presence in the present through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, leading and guiding us into the future that God has prepared for us. It, it is in his dwelling with us that we can know God's constant presence and encouragement. There are many things in life which, uh, that need help and strength to face. Not least the challenges we are facing at the moment because of coronavirus. But there can be other issues too, such as bereavement of family or close friends, job loss, disputes at work or in the family, struggles with our health. Or maybe we are struggling with sin as we seek to live for God and we want to put that right. Well, we can be encouraged to face all these things with the knowledge that Jesus is personally present with us. And as we look to him, that he will be the help and the strength we need to lead us through. God uses the crossing of the River Jordan in Joshua 3 as an important moment for his people to be encouraged. God powerfully keeps the promises that he has made to them as he pushes back the waters of the Jordan so that they can cross over on dry ground. God powerfully demonstrates that as the Ark of the Covenant is carried ahead of them, his presence will drive the nations away so that the people of Israel can inherit the promised land, just as he has driven the waters away here. God's people can be encouraged that as they consecrate themselves to serve him, God will never leave them nor forsake them. He is at the heart of them to be a constant encouragement every step of the way in the present as he guides them into the future. But this is not the end of the story for Joshua and for the people of Israel. As they enter the promised land, there's an enormous task ahead of them. Once we know God's presence with us, then we too have an enormous task ahead of us to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. This is what one hymn writer calls a task unfinished that drives us to our knees. But we, like Israel, need to be encouraged by what God has done in the past and is doing in the present so that we can go forward with this task into the future. And as we look to the past, we can be encouraged by the words of Jesus who said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The wonderful truth is this. As we live and work for Jesus, his leadership of us is not from a distance. He doesn't tell us what to do and then leaves us alone to get on with it. We are to be encouraged that he is personally present with us, leading us from within and is at the very heart of his people. We can be encouraged by this as individuals and we can also be encouraged as a fellowship that even if we have the smallest number possible, just two or three people. Jesus declares that when we come together in his name, he is personally present in our midst. Just as with Joshua and Israel, the importance of God's encouragement for us in Jesus is that we respond to that blessing. A few moments ago, I quoted from Bishop Frank Houghton's hymn, Facing a Task unfinished which as he wrote drives us to our knees now of course that has a double meaning if we don't trust in the presence and power of Jesus the task he has given to us will indeed be overwhelming but if we do trust in his presence and power then we should be encouraged 
to be driven to our knees in prayer. We need to pray that God continues to keep us fit for his service as we confess our sin and commit every part of our lives to him. We need to pray that we would be encouraged by the personal presence of the Lord Jesus working in us and through us in our community, country and the wider world. We need to pray that as God's people we give a clear witness to his saving power in our own lives and are prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus as we fully rely on the strength and power he gives us. For us, as for Israel, this means our own wholehearted trust and obedience to God's calling and leading so that as we pray, trust and work for him in the present, we will be encouraged by the way in which we see him working to be led by him into the future. May God richly bless us as we do these things for his glory. Amen.